All righty. Welcome, welcome everyone to our November PL and Res All Hands. Um, it's actually the first of December, but we're we're squeaking it in in some sometimes on somewhere. Maybe it's still November. Um, agenda for this meeting. Um, we have a meaty working group update for you, which includes um, a look back at kind of 2022 strategy and also a preview of focus for 2023 across this working group um, and roadmap stuff. So it's going to be uh, fun. We'll spend a little bit more time there than usual. Um, no deep dives today, but we have a lot of awesome spotlights across um, many groups as we go into the end of the year. So let's get right to it. Hopefully we actually have time for Q&A, um, which we usually don't. As a reminder, what is the PL Endres Working Group? Um, we are one of many teams in the Protocol Ops Network where we drive breakthroughs in computing technology to push humanity forward. We're all unified and work across many of these groups, um, kind of working on the, the core of making the internet more accessible because we think it empowers amazing superpowers for humanity and wanted to have a solid, robust foundation, including things like quantum addressing, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, um, and high user agency. Uh, and we want to make it a, a kind of secure foundation for humanity's most important information and collaboration and tools. Um, we do that through supporting and growing a number of breakthrough computing projects. Um, three of the ones we contribute to heavily in this working group are IPFS, LibP2P, and Filecoin, but also many others, including DRAND, IPLD, uh, multi-formats, test ground, and more. Our mission is to scale and unlock new opportunities for these protocols. Um, we do that in a myriad of ways. These are our different teams. I think we actually have some updates to do. There's lots more sub-teams within these teams as well um, these days. Um, and this is our strategy for 2022. This is kind of what's guided the core of our work. Um, there is actually now a great video, I think when it's in the spotlight section, um, that describes what are the things the Andres team has done around this 2022 strategy over the past year. Um, first, around growing the, the teams contributing to these open source protocols and enabling network native development. Then around uh, making sure robust storage and retrieval um, is available across IPFS and Filecoin and that we are gaining kind of adoption through real user data. We're driving breakthroughs in programmability, scalability, and compute, and doing all of that while, most importantly, keeping all of our critical network operations running really smoothly, releasing, upgrading, burning down tech debt, things like that. So these are our OKRs for Q4 that align with that. Um, we've already done some of them, which is good, given that it's the last month of the quarter and it's a short month at that. Um, but a couple of them are um, are still open or still landing. Um, uh, these are around the same objectives from the beginning of the year, um, around growing our um, knowledgeable and aligned developers within the PL stack. Um, we succeeded with an amazing set of presentations at IPFS Camp Lab Week. Um, Phil Lisbon, Phil Bangalore, which just happened the past couple of days. Thank you for everyone who was um, making making it out to India and presenting there. That's fantastic. Um, the photos look phenomenal. I'm very jealous. Um, and it gotten a ton both of in-person engagement, but also um, kind of uh, accessibility to remote communities. And remember, most of the viewers and engagement for these things are actually in the future. And so always prepare um, those presentations with an eye towards future people that will be um, working on it. We've shifted our focus from kind of more general hiring um, growth across teams, just especially given macro and, and crypto conditions, um, to focus more on leadership hiring. Um, and so making sure that we can bring in the leads that help scale um, our organizations and kind of reduce um, kind of burden on coordinating some of the, the working groups um, and teams that sit within our space. Um, around uh, accessible and robust storage and retrieval, uh, congrats to Saturn and Station on their their MVP launches. Um, very, very exciting to have the um, early versions of those out. I'm starting to gain users and adoption um, and continued work goes towards making sure new data added to Filecoin is retrievable reliably and also retrievable from Kubo and IPFS gateway users who want to access data stored in Filecoin. And so this is, um, there's a chunk of work going towards that. I don't think we're currently on track to hit this OKR as it was stated a uh, couple, uh, months back, but um, we're, we're going to measure and keep working towards that. Breakthroughs around scalability and compute, um, launch of FBM BuilderNet. I think they've named this to hyperspace, hypernet, hyper something or other, um, with many highly useful smart contracts of which we have at least 20 amazing exemplar case studies. I think we're, I think we're on track for this. I think it's gonna be great. Um, and then landing concrete go-to-market roadmaps for interplanetary consensus, retrieval markets, time-locked encryption, 
um, and a number of our other breakthroughs. Um, they have great roadmaps. I think we need a little bit of refinement to get them to concrete go-to-market roadmap status, um, but we're making progress towards that, which is great. Um, in terms of keeping things running smoothly, um, we have actually already achieved our uh, Q4 goal, which was to cut our spend on um, kind of centralized uh, legacy web two infra services like AWS um, without hurting our overall um, uh, performance and quality, which is great. Um, I think we're actually going to overachieve on this OKR significantly. I think we can get to 50% cut by end of year, which is phenomenal um, without negative impacts, which like huge kudos to everyone who has refocused time to help us get to that. It is important and valuable. It means we can put more resources back into the Web3 ecosystems that um, we participate in, which is exactly what we want to do. Um, and so congrats to everyone. And then uh, final goal is around maintaining uptime. So we still have an AI to make this really more clear and precise. Um, but obviously, we can't grade that until the time frame is up because that's a, you know, any moment uh, we can be spending time on that. Cool. And this is our core improvements roadmap that we've been looking at for the past year-ish, six months. And we have a ton of check marks. So many things accomplished since our last all hands together, like pause, unmute, round of applause for all the amazing launches. We haven't gotten together in this format in a while, but like, thank you, thank you, everyone. Super exciting. Um, and there's a... Uh, yeah, a ton to celebrate here. Um, uh, and we it's amazing to see us hitting into the end of the year and just shipping awesome stuff uh, all the time. Big congratulations to all the teams that are having, um, have, having big moments like that. I mentioned we were going to talk about 2023 strategy as well. Um, there is, again, a really good recording of this that's up on the um, PL YouTube channel, which um, we will link to you, that talks up and breaks down these areas of 2023 strategy. Um, but this you know, it really builds on top of what we've been focused on for the past year and maps pretty nicely to also Falcoin focusing first um, at the base layer on critical system stewardship, then growing team and overall network contribution towards PL stack protocols. Master plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then robust storage and retrieval and then compute over Falcoin state and data. Um, and so that that is our driving strategy for next year, um, which led us into this roadmap for next year, which is a, a first draft of this that we shared at um, Lab Week and um, a number of other summits during that kind of Lisbon blockchain week. Um, and we've been working for the past couple of weeks on making this not be a slide that is very hard to maintain and update, but actually putting this into tooling uh, that then is accessible and, and computable across people. Still a little bit work in progress on that, but we're happy to share a very uh, first draft of what that looks like. We still have some iteration to do, and it's a great opportunity for everyone to take a look at it. But we went from kind of, you know, looking across these major initiatives and breakthroughs landing next year to um, using this new tool called Star Maps, which you're going to hear more about in half a second, um, to visualize the Falcon Core Improvements Roadmap. Now, I don't think I have everything because I had to squeeze through everyone's different roadmaps to find the right milestones um, and people didn't always define them the exact same way that I had defined them above. Um, so I think we're missing, say, compute over data, maybe a couple of other things. Um, but we have other things that weren't there before. And that's exactly what we want to get is more visibility across all these different teams. Um, huge thank you to the uh, Ignite team, which like jumped in and made this happen. Uh, and, and to Reed, who uh, kicked off this project um, with Juan to uh, actually go in and build and design and implement um, this tool. We can we can queue that up for later. Um, you can go there and see these various different roadmaps. You can click into the GitHub issues that back them. All of these issues are across many other people's roadmaps. So when those individuals update those milestones, they will move around in time in this roadmap, saving me the effort of updating it always, which is wonderful. Um, and so this is ideally what we're going to use going forward. You notice that there's probably some feedback loops for you as you look at your milestones within this roadmap are like, hmm, I should probably make sure to put the title of my uh, thing in my milestone so that, uh, you know, L1 nodes. Oh yeah, those are Saturn L1 nodes, but you don't have that context um, visualized here in Star Map. So there's some, some learnings there for us to continue iterating on, but really amazing progress and super excited to see. So what are roadmaps? Um, we, we have a, uh, a talk on this more from uh, conversations at Lab Week and our Endress Summit. Um, we actually have Juan here. Juan, if you want to talk through this, you did a really great presentation on it. This is me grabbing your slides, um, but I can voice over. Yeah, happy to. Um, the thing here is that uh, when you think about roadmaps, there are several different 
uh, levels at which you might think about describing uh, a roadmap for a team uh, or a project. Uh, there's, of course, the lowest Zoom level uh, might be a, a very detailed um, set of tasks and to-dos that you and your team are directly executing on. Uh, and then when you can sort of zoom out uh, from that and you start thinking about the milestones that you're working with uh, other teams in adjacent areas with, um, you, you're kind of, you look at a higher granularity, then you can zoom out uh, at an even uh, higher level and then start looking at um, a set of uh, specific milestones that then maybe consumers of your project or or other groups that are um, you know further away from uh, from your work, but are, but are dependent upon your work, um, need information about and so on. So there's, um, as, as you're thinking about kind of updating and, and describing uh, progress along a, a vision or progress along a um, trajectory for a project, it's extremely useful to have these um, different roadmaps, uh, different levels of granularity for the different groups that um, that need access to this information. So um, we've done pretty well in terms of uh, figuring out kind of the, the lower granularity uh, roadmaps and various different teams use different tools, uh, everything from GitHub to Gantt charts to um, their own uh, tasks and to-do lists and whatnot. Um, and what we were missing was this kind of like a uh, higher level Zoom view, uh, what here in the slide is described as kind of like Zoom level three in a sense, um, that corresponds well to the kind of um, uh, roadmaps that a number of teams have been working on in the last uh, couple of quarters uh, in terms of having kind of a um, a roadmap on the with uh, milestones on the order of like three to three to six milestones uh, spanning somewhere between you know kind of two to six quarters uh, ahead in time. Uh, these are not kind of like um, very uh, prescriptive uh, boundaries, but they kind of give you a sense of uh, roughly the set of milestones that you want to be able to communicate uh, to a large set of users that kind of want to know um, the progress on the project. So uh, that's the set of roadmaps that we're using to coordinate across all of our teams and with a lot of the dependent users. Um, that's kind of like that Zoom level three set of roadmaps. And that's what's going to go into start maps and and in, and which Molly uh, has been using in the um, core improvement roadmap slides. Like those are kind of like that Zoom level three. Exactly. And I think that was my next slide as well. Like probably the biggest thing, having read through everyone's roadmaps um, over the past couple of days since those uh, we landed first drafts of those um, earlier this week is um, we've tended to do too many uh, is your biggest takeaway is focus, focus, focus. You can have more milestones that you keep track of as your team, as what you're working on. But when you visualize a user focused roadmap, um, this is like five milestones a year. If you have five themes per year, each of which has five milestones, you're doing it wrong. That's too many milestones. Um, those are not user focused milestones. Those are maybe team development milestones. And so um, focus, focus your roadmaps come up. And the wonderful thing is this is now computable. It's in tools, it's in GitHub issues. Um, you can have many issues and you can have different views that you, um, you include some children in one view, but not another view. And so um, big thanks to, to this new computable tool, which is more machine readable, interlinkable, um, uh, and automates that visualization process, you actually get much more optionality on how you want to visualize things, which I think is really exciting. Yeah, r roughly the the mass on um, count here, you know, will depend by project. Like you, you know, it's not exactly five or something like that. It's kind of like a, think of it as a range, uh, but definitely like if you're giving people more than six things to care about, like you're already kind of um, past the the point of um, them being able to remember and so on. So really think of the the Zoom level three as um, you know, communicating to thousands, to, to tens of thousands of people, um, not not a very granular thing. Um, what most team members individually will care about in your team is is the lower level, lower granularity map. So kind of like Zoom level one and two. Julie, I don't know if you want to talk us really quickly through star maps, the tool yeah. that Ignite has helped us build. <laughs> So I, I think a lot was already said, so I'll skip over some things. Um, but yeah, most, if not all of Endra's teams have now added their roadmaps to GitHub. So huge thank you there and huge thank you to everyone who's offered feedback along the way. Um, for the time being, you can find those links in Notion. We'll probably figure out a better a better home for those. Um, but yeah, all the links that you see in, in the link there are compatible with star maps. Um, so feel free to play around and explore some other team roadmaps. So just quickly, this is what you would see if you pasted a roadmap link in star maps. This one is actually a rendering of roadmaps across all of Endres. Um, in the, de the detailed view, which is what you're looking at, uh, you can see that top level issue and then a milestone one level down. Um, if that milestone has child milestones, you can keep clicking into that so you get more and more granular um, as you go. 
Uh, each one, as Molly mentioned, has a link to GitHub, so you can follow along on um, the issue there. Uh, and then also as those child milestone issues close in GitHub, you'll start to see a progress indicator, which we're not seeing on this one yet, but we will soon. <laughs> um, it, it is working though, so if you do have any closed issues, you'll see it for uh, your roadmap. But yeah, I'm intentionally not going into too much detail. That's the gist of it. Would love though folks to play around and, and offer any feedback that they have um, so that we can help make this tool super uh, user-friendly and great for the org. Thank you so much for building this. Um, yeah, I put, I grabbed this together from all of the different roadmaps. I think there is some, you know, already immediate learnings from going through that exercise. I created like six new root issues um, last night with different visualizations of sub milestones. Um, like definitely um, learnings around if you break things up into a lot of different themes, hard to see what are the major milestones that are happening within there. All you get is the theme, not the milestone. Um, and also uh, if you don't put any ETAs in your root issue, then, then that gives us warnings and concerns. Uh, and so always put an ETA and uh, you know just do your best estimate for what's contained within um, the, the roadmap that's being described there. Um, but I definitely think this gives us a highly flexible tool. We're gonna keep iterating on it. Um, but the really cool thing that this is unlocks Again, all of these issues are happening in each team's specific repo in GitHub where they are tracking kind of their roadmap areas. Many different people own these different issues and can make their own views. Um, if you have other ecosystems in, um, you know, say the LibP2P space or IPFS where many different teams across implementations like IRO and um, uh, other groups are building uh, capabilities that create cross dependencies or should live in an overall IPFS project roadmap or um, Falcon project roadmap that extends across multiple groups. Um, we can create visualizations across the roadmaps of all of those different teams and communities. It's truly open source and cross ecosystem and network native in how it can visualize the, the contributions that are happening across many different teams. So we do not see this as a thing just for Endres, we are biting the bullet of helping build the tool and be early guinea pig testers of putting our roadmaps in it. But we would love to see this become more um, used and a tool that is uh, super valuable across the whole PL network. Um, but we still have some work to do to, to get it to that point. And one thing you'll notice as we start using these is that we'll start seeing that some of the milestones uh, won't line up, meaning uh, some dependencies will like strike out as, hey, wait, suddenly like these milestones won't actually be possible. Um, and yeah, that's exactly what we hope will pop out of a, a lot of this stuff. Um, so a lot of the, uh, these, these are the first kind of integration of everybody's individual roadmaps. It'll take a, a while while we kind of sort through that and, and detangle some of the dependencies. And I think right now we don't have, we have children, but we don't have dependencies yet between different areas. And so that's a, a future thing um, for us to be able to define those dependencies and, um, make things turn red if the timeline of a dependency is after the timeline of a thing that is dependent on it. Great, that, that gives us good uh, good signals. Um, and we can use these visualization tools to alert us and then drill down within these areas. Um, and so that is, this is the wonderful tool, Star Maps. You can open items in GitHub. Um, you can swap into a more detailed view that sees kind of the sub items within um, different themes. Um, all sorts of really, really cool stuff. And so big, big thanks to the Ignite team for building this. Please keep giving them lots of feedback as GitHub issues on the Star Maps repo. And um, and yeah, we're gonna keep keep moving forward on it. That's it I had for, for road mapping today. And let's hop into team updates, uh, starting with IPFS. Hey, yeah. Uh, IPFS makes the web work peer to peer. Uh, first thing you'll notice is the network nodes went down a lot. Um, on that upper left graph. Uh, turns out this measurement is not quite what we thought it was. So we're trying to uh, uh, refine this metric here. Um, the, the network size from what we understand didn't actually go down. It's just that the, this metric is not measuring what we thought it was. So we're going to refine this metric and, and, and put a better one here. Um, we have whole, uh, the other two metrics, find latency, which is the content routing latency. Uh, you know, we've held held steady all year long at around 400 milliseconds for that. And uh, we've been staying on top of pull requests. Also, in case anyone didn't know, uh, we had IPFS camp um, last month in uh, Lisbon. 
it was amazing. Uh, there was a ton of people there and everyone was really excited. Um, you know, 17 tracks with a hundred plus speakers. So and all of the content that is on YouTube. So for anyone who couldn't make it, you can go on YouTube and find all the videos on there. Uh, you'll be spending a long time catching up on them. As far as work goes, uh, today we turned off the uh, DHT caching of the Hydras, um, which is going to save at least $30,000 a month, possibly more. Um, I did have a nice graph on there, but uh, I think you'll need to refresh, but that's okay. Um, the plan is to turn off the Hydras entirely next year, but we're going to have to wait on content router discovery. Um, just so everyone's aware, uh, uh, Dennis did a lot of good work analyzing how much the hydras were contributing and what the impact would be when we turn them off. Uh, so we know that this isn't really negatively affecting the network very much. Um, we released Kubo 0 0.17, which turned on the libp2p resource manager by default, which gives us DOS protection from a lot of different DOS vectors on Kubo nodes. Uh, it also included uh, the tar response format support for gateways. And we marked the reframe as deprecated, but it is not yet removed because we have a new HTTP API for reframe based on a bunch of feedback and issues that came up with reframe. Uh, so that'll be in the next release in 0.18. Um, there's a couple new working groups for IPFS. There's a data transfer working group called Move the Bytes, um, which is being headed up by B5 from the IRO project. Um, and there's a content routing working group. Uh, you can there's Slack channels for both of them if you're interested. Um, yeah, so upcoming uh, delegated content routing uh, by the uh, the end of two weeks from now, we expect uh, Sid contact to be available on all IPFS.io gateway requests. Um, currently, it's enabled on some small subset of them, so it's not reliable. Uh, but we're rolling that out to all the gateway nodes so that uh, they can discover who the who the content providers are from the sid.contact indexers. And um, we're going to finalize the design for ambient discovery of content routers so that we don't have to hard code any indexers like sid.contact into Kubo. They will just be discovered by asking around uh, on the network. Um, and we'll release Kubo 0 0.18, which will include some new response formats. It'll add the HTTP API and remove reframe. Uh, web transport will be enabled by default, which was a popular topic in Lisbon. Um, and we're also starting to consolidate all of the Kubo libraries into a single repo called libipfs. Um, and then in January, we've got uh, verifiable IPNS, optimistic provide, which reduces the amount of time it takes to add content by a whole lot. And we're going to start working on some double hashing improvements to uh, improve your privacy on the IPFS network. Thanks, guys. All right. Uh, try and make this quick. So uh, we've already got the name drop a few times already in the slide. So new name, Ignite. Um, I want to welcome our new team members, Nishant and Dan. They've already been doing some great work. Thanks, you guys. Uh, there was a new release of IPFS Companion for the first time in a year and a half. That took a huge effort. Uh, big shout out to Lytle, David Justice, and Nishant there. Um, Star Maps, you've heard uh, about already, but I do want to thank everybody who contributed with GitHub issues, PRs, Slack comments, anything and everything. Uh, and then we're working on uh, metrics. That'll be kind of our first priority for our roadmap to get numbers for all of our products. We've got some here. Uh, and yeah, we'll work on fine tuning those. I've tried to link the, the issues for tracking that. Um, yeah, so that we can give you more information, uh, more metrics on slides in the future. And then the list of upcoming, I won't go through that. You could read that, but uh, that's about it. Hi everyone. Uh, this is the IPJS highlights um, since the last uh, the last all hands. So we've shipped a couple of things. Like we've basically been uh, concentrating on hardening efforts for uh, JSLib P2P. This is mostly to support uh, ChainSafe and Lodestar with the the Ethereum two merge. Um, so there's a lot of uh, much greater uh, uh, DOS protection and Eclipse attack protection now. Um, we've got documentation on how to. Uh, protect yourself against common attacks, um, how to tweak limits on memory usage and 
like connection limits and how to how to ensure that you you are connected to the peers that you value uh, the most. We've dropped um, uh, support for uh, V two uh, sorry V one signatures and IPNS. Um, that's in the IPFS release, uh, which also includes the uh, the lib P2P release. Uh, yeah, lots of stuff, lots of um, small uh, bug fixes and performance improvements. Um, we you know, did a bunch of talks at IPFS camp. Uh, there are links there available. You can watch them uh, if you miss them. Um, yeah, we're trying to grow the team. We're going to ship a new lib P2P uh, next week that has uh, revamped metrics. Loads of stuff. It's uh, just lots going on. Um, I am going to hand over to somebody else. All right. Uh, greetings from snowy Mammoth Lakes, California. I'm Marco, here to give you some lib P2P news you can use. So we got a lot of stuff here. Huge highlight, WebRTC browser to server is, is out. It's merged. Uh, huge, it was a huge effort. We had like 400 plus commits on the spec alone. Uh, we started this like in May, but the ideas have been floating around since 2019. Um, it's now enabled by default on the small dot network. Uh, and thanks go out to Parity, Little Bear Labs, and a bunch of other folks that helped out with making that spec and the whole thing work. Some other news is we got uh, a spec for how to do lib P2P on top of HTTP. This is gonna enable a lot of use cases. Um, and so if you're interested in this, please reach out to me or any other lib P2P person. Uh, we're kind of looking for someone to like pair with and like develop this uh, in tandem. I think like a lot of the new data transfer protocols might might want to do this. Um, we got a performance spec out, which will help establish a standard for how we talk about performance. Uh, we got some test ground interop work we're doing. In Lisbon, we had our first ever lib P2P day, which while well, I got personally sick and couldn't attend from everyone I talked to. It sounds like a great event. Uh, so you should check out the recap post. There's a lot of really good talks that, that happened there. Um, one, one of my favorites was uh, Tangi's talk on Nim Lu P2P. So I, I recommend that one. I thought that was a really fun one. Uh, Alt Patar also did a really fun um, power of two choices on how like the Kademli DHT is, is balanced. Um, we have a new doc site, which looks really snazzy. Thanks to Andy for that work. Uh, and we're updating the roadmap from user feedback. So we're now prioritizing lib P2P and HTTP work. Um, for implementations, we got a new version of Rust lib P2P, which has quick. This is, this is huge, quick is awesome. Uh, it will make your connections have fewer, a fewer latency for your connection. Um, and this is a project that started like four years ago. So it's great to see, great to see it out. Uh, we have browser to server in Rust Loop P2P. We have a new version of Build P2P coming out soon. Uh, this is gonna allow you to listen web transport and quick on the same port, which means you're not gonna have to open up and deal with new firewall rules if you already have quick set up. And we also have deterministic search hashes. So if you restart the node, you don't have to now propagate a whole new multi-adder for web transport. Uh, JS Loop P2P. Uh, Alex talked a little bit about this, but we got metrics and observability. Okay, feed mode uh, coming up December and January. We got uh, generating lib P2P KPIs, working with uh, test ground, better interrupt testing, uh, more browser connectivity, and we're going to launch a lib P2P blog. All right, Falcon again, where our decentralized uh, crypto power uh, storage network is what we're trying to build here. Uh, KPIs. Uh, Again, today's like network to uh, storage capacity is a little bit degraded because we just shipped a network upgrade yesterday. So while we do network upgrades, normally we will have to slowly recover um, the power um, due to a storage provider upgrading their nodes and possibly like missing window post. Uh, but as of today, uh, the network power is like 15.31. Uh, Exubytes is still a lot, and as you can see, there are more data getting onboarded uh, onto the file coin via deals. Uh, gradually, we are almost 400 pip uh, for the data. We also hit a new daily max of committed deals, which is like four pip a day, which is like 
amazing. So we are pretty, we are only one pit uh, away from our fifth pit per day goal. So, you know, that's quite cool. Uh, some high level fall queen uh, highlights. You have heard about the shark uh, a lot over the past couple of months, and it's finally released uh, yesterday. Uh, we have landed a lot of like Alex work uh, that set a really good foundation for user programmable uh, like smart contract uh, upon FEV M launch. Also, like set a good foundation for especially for the storage market side of the things. And um, there's a uh, shark blog. Uh, with all the details. So if you're interested in that, I just want to say huge congrats and thanks to the whole team, Sen like mostly the Lotus team and also a lot of support from the field infra, a Sentinel team to help us like making sure the network upgrade uh, goes smoothly and we have the matrix to monitor the healthy of the network. Uh, the next thing is we have Travis has shipped a new lightweight file queen chain snapshot uh, snapshot service for the file queen community. Uh, as you a lot of you probably know uh, that uh, to join the Falcon network, it's basically impossible to sync from like Genesis. So a lot of op the node operators and storage providers are dependent on snapshot uh, to quickly sync up the chain and uh, interact with the chain. So a snapshot service is like quite important. Uh, since yesterday's upgrade, we are already seeing over a thousand uh, requests uh, downloaded just yesterday and over the past week, uh, there are are uh, 3,700 of requests uh, for the new sna snapshot service, uh, which is quite amazing. Um, I believe we will have a spotlight from someone from the FVM team on this, uh, but there's a hack FEVM that was a hack sound uh, at the East Global, uh, which a lot of like uh, EVM related developer resources were shipped to the community and there are worth over like 400 registrations and there's over 100 submissions of the final applications, which is quite important, uh, quite amazing. And also, most importantly, there are six bugs that was uh, discovered through the hexon, uh, which help us like hardening the FEM uh, implementations. Again, there's a spotlight later, so I won't go into the details. Uh, last but not least, I do want to mention that uh, SP Girls team has posted a discussion on network girls and the current challenges and proposed solutions. Uh, as you may hear the talks uh, from the places, uh, there are uh, macroeconomy challenges uh, in general uh, for the crypto uh, uh, industry. So like, how does that impact like Falcon? What kind of the Falcon challenges are we facing? Uh, and how can we uh, propose some protocol changes potentially help our community and ecosystem uh, is quite a topic that we're trying to discover right now. So please take a, uh, take a look at that post. And if you have any ideas, please share in the discussion. Upcoming uh, FEV, FVM team is launching a hyperspace test network that's developer focused. I believe potentially it's going to ship on December the 8th. FVM team should confirm that. Uh, but if you know anyone uh, that is interested in develop like FEVM, EVM contact, compatible smart contract or like applications uh, on the network, ask them to join uh, and test their smart contracts uh, uh, in hyperspace. Uh, and also the core devs are working really hard uh, to, to align on what to include in the NV18, the next network upgrade, uh, the scope and the timeline. Uh, if you're interested uh, in the TPM forum, there's a discussion uh, you can follow on. I think that's everything for Falcoin. So IPDX developer experience our IP stewards team. Uh, so first of all, our old mobs are up, so you can visit them, comment, let us know what you think. Next item, our collaboration with Bloxico on test ground on EKS uh, came to fruition finally, and the alpha version is out and Celestia is already using it in, in their testing scheme and running it on scale. So that's exciting. On the test ground side, we do fully support large test matrices that Leap P2P is going to use and is working very hard on making it easy to maintain and, and present on their side. Uh, so that's really great too. Uh, we were working with little bear labs on browser uh, support in test grounds, uh, and we do have a working example of that as well. Uh, GitHub management landed in three new orgs, and one of them wasn't even set up by me. Uh, so that's really cool. <laughs> uh, 
uh, we've been to IPFS camp and our very own Laurent presented a talk on uh, interrupt testing in libp 2 p with TestGround. Uh, I highly recommend watching that. Uh, and TestGround is finally being used by, by devs all around, by libp 2 p Magma, Celestia, Iro, Sigma Prime. Uh, so it, it's really great to see our efforts like, actually paying off. Uh, there are plenty of things we want to focus on next uh, on the Kubo side. We're working on CI migration to GitHub Actions and release process automation. And on test grounds, uh, we are moving integration testing to go from Bash. Uh, we are going to improve network simulation uh, to be able to provide even uh, more reliable network simulations. Uh, we are migrating docs off of Gitbook, uh, which is almost done. and. Uh, we are going to start collecting data on GitHub Actions. And Test Grounds 2022 report is coming out soon. Uh, keep an eye out for that. More uh, interesting stuff of what we've been up to is going to be included there. Thank you. Cool. Team updates. This cycle, we, we're moving on to a cadence where I think every, every three months, every quarter, we rotate through a various subset of teams to do slightly deeper dives into what they're working on. Um, because we're we have a lot of teams now, a lot of awesome projects happening. Uh, this month we have Consensus Lab, Crypto Econ Lab, Dag House, Sentinel, and DRAND. So starting with Consensus Lab. Hey, thanks, Molly. So uh Consensus Lab, uh, I will just give an update since the since the lab week. So the big day was actually this Monday when we shipped the uh, SpaceNet. So SpaceNet launched like uh, as we promised on November 28th, uh, as per our roadmap. And so far it ordered already 1 million blocks. And if the math doesn't work, this is because we did some pre mines So basically we launched the network actually last week. And then when we were like, uh, we were not resetting it on Monday, no, November 28th. Uh, but okay, I mean, uh, there is no, like if you want to get some uh, tokens, just go to our faucet and start playing with it. Uh, so far you can send uh, very fast fields around, right? So you can send Filecoin uh, at the latency of like one second. And this mimics like the consensus protocol that we are using mimics what we are going to use on L2s and beyond. But what we did is essentially we integrated this consensus protocol with Lotus, all the way to Lotus. And this took us uh, most of the engineering work basically in the last few weeks. Uh, we launched the fill space uh, latency, or no latency, oh, I'm, I'm reading what, uh, one post, uh, field space, uh, basically landing page for all things IPC. Uh, go there to check uh, basically updates on, on IPC. And then basically for SpaceNet, there is a set of, uh, on GitHub, there is a landing page which takes you uh, wherever you need to go. Uh, Enrique Moniz joined us uh, on November 21 as a research engineer, very experienced. So this is our most experienced hire. And we expect a lot from Enrique and welcome. Uh, I did I did have a one bullet where I mentioned the consensus day. We delivered consensus day after lab week. So this was on November 7 with ACM CCS. And so we had a plenty on our table basically since lab week. Uh, we are looking forward to winter colo with a few other people. We are going to be strongly represented there. Uh, strong hiring pipeline waiting for uh, headcounts and hiring strategy eagerly, eagerly. And uh, basically we're working with Medusa CryptoNet uh, uh, team. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to bring them to the SpaceNet. Uh, and yeah, so Pikachu is also getting some attention uh, as we are invited to write a cover blog on one of the smart contract uh, research sites uh, just today. Thanks a lot. Awesome. And if you're curious what Pikachu is, go into the consensus Slack channel and ask and also post your big best meme of Pikachu. Uh, moving on to Crypto Econ Lab. Dave. Cool. Thanks, Molly. Hey, friends. Dave here from Crypto Econ Lab. Uh, let's start with updates at the top left. Uh, the FVM rollout uh, is anticipated to affect the gas economy. So if you follow that little arrow over to the right, the diagram kind of goes over that. Basically, the problem that we're looking at there is that more messages from FEM equates to some transition phase before base fees then equilibrate. That will probably be higher with more uh, messages occurring. So then you have that little delta T there. There's a transition phase there. We need to do modeling to project what the trajectories of that transition phase are going to look like, how much time is it going to take, and ultimately, what's the magnitude of that change 
what does that do to the economics, the ROI, that sort of stuff. So that's kind of the, the game plan there. Uh, we have a work plan and a discussion on GitHub that's linked in the bullet point. Uh, we're asking for feedback, questions, and ideas. So please check that out. Uh, another update, number two, we're working with the Saturn team. Uh, we're exploring upgrades to the current incentive design uh, with respect to collateral mechanisms, putting down, staking some collateral, uh, and then maybe breaking out rewards into uh, regional segments so that you know different cost regimes have different uh, reward structures that may be uh, you know, better tuned to, to them running well. Uh, third update, we are drafting a project proposal uh, to do a incentive design for compute over data. So all of those links are there. Uh, opportunities. Uh, the one that we highlighted, uh, Jennifer brought up this new discussion that the ecosystem put up, team put out. Uh, there's continued macroeconomic and cryptoeconomic challenges. They articulated them very well. So our team right now is listening to community feedback. We're analyzing potential enhancements. We have a few uh, tools in our tool bag that we are thinking about applying. So we're tuned into that discussion, uh, you know, very, very much. And, you know, we just wanted to highlight that for other people. Uh, where to find us? Uh, we have our links there. The one new thing I'll point out here is that we have office hours that we're just starting. So love to have have you come join us. We have one per month in the Americas time zone uh, and one per month in the kind of Europe APAC friendly time zones. So thanks a lot. It's awesome. Great, uh, great technique and something other groups could could emulate. Daghouse. Hello, this is David with an update for Daghouse. So NFT storage crossed 100 million uploads. That is a ton. Um, in terms of just general growth between NFT storage and Web3 storage, things are holding fairly you know, linearly, not a big drop off since the winter started. So uh, crypto is cyclical, but um, turns out data storage is not. So that's great. Um, the team is all hands on deck, heads down on finishing uh, W3Up, which is our new uh, you can authorized uh, upload API and client. Um, and integrating it with Web3 storage and NFT storage. And um, we're really excited about the potential of UCANs here. We talked to a ton of folks in Lisbon who gave us uh, very useful feedback, but also gave us kind of the thumbs up that this is a great direction. But um, as soon as you expose delegatable, verifiable auth, it just exposes a ton of search this area out there. So you got to worry about it at like the protocol level. Is the protocol you're designing something that is going to be future proof? But then also think about all the uh, service area in terms of um, user stories and user experience, making sure you know that's exactly what users want, and you're not leaving a ton exposed to things like attacks. Um, and then you know, writing a new backend um, authorization system, something that can take in metrics scalably, that sort of thing. So um, yeah, it's a ton of work. Not to mention migrating all the users from the old stuff to the new stuff. So I'm really glad that we have such a great team working on that. Thanks to everyone there. Um, and then just a, an update on the NFT storage front as we proceed to nucleation, uh, we uh, hired a NFT storage lead PM, which is great. Uh, she'll start in January and start to uh, carve out a small portion of the team to, to work on really the dedicated NFT storage mission as it continues to be built on the Web3 storage platform. We're still lead, looking for a lead uh, tech lead there. Um, so if you know anyone who might be interested, please do let me know. Um, as far as opportunities go, just in general, talking to a ton of potential users in different spaces that um, really kind of share what content addressing and decentralized storage can really be game changers for in their spaces, places like gaming with Unreal Engine, uh, video, um, you know, the Web3 dev tools with the Koi team and Third Web, folks like that. Um, so really kind of just fleshing out where we might rediscover product market fit as we duplicate as a paid product. Um, and then we're also chatting with Bedrock in terms of um, how, as their efforts proceed, uh, we can take advantage of um, increasing the amount of uh, infrastructure or the file point side of infrastructure we're relying on in production for users and kind of serving their needs as, as reliably and quickly as possible. And that's it. Thanks. Awesome. Congrats on passing 100 million. Very impressive. Sentinel. Thanks, Moni. Uh, this is Ferdy from Sentinel. So yesterday, uh, we shipped the uh, new release to support a new network upgrade. Um, there's, it was some hiccup, but uh, things are back to normal and we are trying to fill um, all the gaps, uh, hopefully by the end of the day. Uh, with this release, we are, we are uh, providing new schemas, a minor beneficiary and data cap balance. The data will be uh, available. 
And uh, we are also migrating to a new infrastructure along with some performance improvement that will help us save um, the cost in the long run. And we are ready to uh, deprecate the old cluster in the staging and production cluster um, accounts. And uh, that will easily save us tens of thousands per month. Uh, the scan update, we um, have an arch archival grade daily Filecoin snapshot uh, since Genesis. So um, this will help us um, facilitate a full chain reprocessing uh, more easily going forward. And it will make it possible to put those uh, snapshots on IPFS or Filecoin uh, in the future. And opportunities, um, we are in talk with Ken Labs for um, some potential collaboration on Open Data Lake idea. Um, they are running. They are, they are already running uh, Lily themselves, and uh, they are interested to use Lily um, for their project, and will be willing to contribute to Lily in the future. Um, more things to follow. Um, and uh, second, um, we are still aiming to um, provide the full chain data uh, in BigQuery by the end of the year, and hopefully we can uh, apply for uh, the the BigQuery public data set. And uh, we're also looking to see if there are potential uh, collaboration with Google. Um, seeing, I, I heard they have some public um, chain state indexing spec, and we'll see um, if there's anything we can uh, work, work together on that. And that's it. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Yolan, dear end. Hello. So this is a bit more than just what happened since Lisbon, but basically all partners have upgraded successfully to V1.4, uh, which is the biggest release we've had of DRAN since last year. So it's a pretty big milestone for us because it means all the work and all the commits we've done that break DRAN. Uh, we did not get any downtime, thankfully, so everything's fine on that front. Uh, we already mentioned it in Lisbon, but uh, StockSwift has started running a relay. So here is the um, URL. If you want to add it to, I don't know, Lotus or whatsoever, you can start using it. It should be working just like the Cloudflare and the Protocol Labs relays. Um, we had a bit less participation than we expected in the LOE and Front Summit in Lisbon, but uh, we had very interesting conversations that already led to a couple new uh, people applying to join the LOE, well, companies applying to join the League of Entropy, and um, that's pretty cool. Um, we are also working on changes we've discussed in Lisbon, so yeah, that was super effective. Uh, we were still working on, you know, maintenance, upgrades. Um, the Patrick is currently doing a huge uh, refactoring of the DKG, which should really eliminate a whole class of bugs we've had in the past during DKG where suddenly one uh, partner would get excluded in the ceremony or it wasn't meant to happen. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we are working on launching a new uh, network, hopefully next week on main on testnet and then a new network the week after on mainnet. This new network will have a swap of the pairing friendly curve we're using. The groups G1 and G2 will change, which means we will have smaller signatures, which is super interesting because uh, we have a lot of signatures. So the smaller, the better. Uh, it will lead to a fit. Beside that, if you want to join the Slack, uh, we have the link at the bottom. And we have more and more people joining the Slack. So currently we're at like 145 people, which is pretty cool. We submitted the time lock paper to Real World Crypto 2023, which will happen in um, Tokyo. So that's pretty cool. We are hopeful it will get accepted because it's a way to turn the existing DRAN network into a network that's provide time lock capabilities. So it's a pretty yeah fun paper and it's already live anyway. And the, oh yeah, we've launched. We've launched. Um, well, we've started the audit of the time lock uh, code with Kudelski Security. Uh, they already found a uh, few bugs we are looking to fix soon. And uh, yeah, nothing critical, but it's ongoing. We will look into setting up fuzzing of the run for Q1 2023. And yeah, that's it on my side. Awesome! Um, congrats on an amazing gathering. I'm very excited for. Uh, LOV expansion and time lock. We are now in our spotlight section. I'm the first one uh, highlighting the Andres Summit, which was a gathering as part of uh, Lisbon Blockchain Week, where we got folks together from, from these various different teams within the Andres Working Group and shared our progress and accomplishments over the past 
year, what different teams had worked on. Um, you can see this video that is up on the PL um, YouTube channel um, with a lot of chapters where you can jump around to specific teams. You can link to specific teams. Highly recommend. People are like, what did you do this year? Share this video. Um, very useful to get a quick index. Um, and we also each presented roadmaps for next year. These are work in progress and will change. We will present them again in January once they're finalized. Um, but a uh, great first look into what each group is going to be focusing on for the next year um, and seeded a lot of really good conversations during Lisbon Blockchain Week. Um, yeah, hey, you know those folks. And it's actually really, really fun to rewatch this. So I recommend it even for people who are there in person um, to page back in. You've probably forgotten some things. Ryers, Nicholas, tell us about deals. Hi, everyone. It was brought to our attention that storage providers were struggling with snap deal. We um, located the pain points, worked our way down the issue list, and the team managed to fix almost every snap issue reported. And to make it even easier for the storage provider, the TSEs made the different ceiling layouts and made diagrams on what works and what doesn't. Uh, there are no new optimizations, but during testing and running the latest hardware, we managed to turn an MTCC sector into a deal sector in less than 15 minutes, which is really fast compared to sealing a new sector. There are three issues left on the board, but they should not be a blocker for any SP that wants to use the feature and onboard data pass. All the fixers will land in Lotus version 119, which will land in one week, and a full report with all the highlights from the sprint will be available on the ocean. That's it. Thank you. Awesome. Much requested, much needed. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, I'm sure the SP community thanks you as well. Space Rep, Net Alfonso. Hello, everyone. So Marco already hyped this, but we have SpaceNet since Monday, and uh, you can start running your own full node. You can start getting some test Filecoin. And soon you will be able to become a validator in the network if you want. So right now, that's why we call it soft launch. Right now we are running our own validators and we only allowed like full nodes. But what we you should expect from this is first to provide snapshots for fast syncing. Like we actually started on Monday, the network. Now we're in a thousand. Like I, when I was doing these slides on Wednesday, we were in the 700s. Today we are 1000. So this is growing fast. That's what one second block times means so it means that now full knows like they have to spend a lot of time until they sync so we need to start figuring out how we're going to manage snapshots or periodic snapshots for full nodes to be able to connect to the network and support uh, light nodes in case someone wants to interact with the network without having to run their full node and then once if evm uh, lands uh, lotus master we also will support solidity contracts in spacenet so that eventually will lead to not empty blocks and actual traffic coming into the network. And that's it. Like There's a SpaceNet Consensus Ninja for the faucet and a SpaceNet uh, repo if you want to read more. And we have a demo afterwards in case you want to uh, dive, dive into the network. Thank you. Awesome. Lots of questions. Join the Slack channel. On to Dennis for Nat Hope Unchained. All right. Hey, everyone. A uh, quick update from uh, from me that we are, or quick reminder that we will be running a nut hole punching month uh, during December, which starts today. So I highly uh, encourage everyone to download a tiny tool to help us in, measure, um, in this measurement campaign. So we want to measure the success rate of the decentralized hole punching um, that was implemented in, um, yeah, in, in Rust and Go and in, in the P2P. And uh, yeah, well, the only thing that you need to do would be to, to download one of these clients and which will um yeah one of these links on the left and if you're on a mac you will you would see the thing that's you and that's on the right there so a little menu bar icon and um, well you, you just start it up and it's in, in the best case it says running and that's it and you leave it running throughout december and it will send um well just results of whole punch uh, whole punches to our server and we can we will analyze this uh, during uh, January. You don't need a running IPFS node, and actually, very, no technical uh, skills are required. For the more tech savvy people, there are also um, command line um, versions or Docker files, and also answer the Galaxy um, configurations. And uh, optionally, you can also register uh, on a Google form. The link is on the bottom left there, and provide some more information on your home network and so on, which will help us in our analysis at the end in January. And well, we have already 80 active API keys, as you can see in the top uh, lower right. Um, and yeah, please 
download the client and uh, participate. So thank you. Awesome. It's super, super, super easy. Get started. Um, last but absolutely not least, Hack FBM. Hey, this is Raul. I'm heading in for Sarah, who's in a in a 17 hour journey right now, and she can't present. Uh, she basically put this together with Nikki, uh, with um, sorry, with Nikki from Articore uh, and other Articore team members. Uh, Hack Febim was a hackathon uh, in collaboration with ETH Global earlier in November, and some top line stats there: 400 plus registrations showing very strong interest in the FEM. We had 117 project submissions, which is a one to 3.5 ratio, which is one of the strongest ratios uh, that EVE Global has seen so far. Uh, and this was amazing because Febim is really being incrementally delivered. We shipped features, key features, at the, the day before uh, to the Wallaby testnet, uh, as long as uh, together with the, with the Filecoin mock um, Solidity library that Zondax put together for this. And literally, this was like bleeding edge going out of the development pipeline into the builder community with like minutes in between. Uh, and it was also a great forcing function to actually get all these deliverables uh, from the team, getting a ton of testing done and also DX clarity around a, a bunch of things. Uh, some insights about the submissions, data DAOs by, were by far the most popular use case. Uh, accounting for 30% of the submissions, uh, where FebM was basically powering storage proposals, DAO operations, and token minting. Uh, DeFi was the second most popular use case, accounting for 9% of the submissions, covering things like liquid staking, lending, uh, automated AMMs, uh, and soulbound tokens, which were a concept introduced uh, to the Web3 space earlier in 2022, were also very popular. And people were marrying soulbound tokens with data primitives, which was pretty cool and pretty unprecedented here. And I think there's, there's a lot to that. And it, that yielded four submissions. Uh, now, uh, this was a great exercise for the team as well. We came back with a ton of learnings. And some of those were, we need a lot more comprehensive developer resources. We kind of like, you know, this was put together very rapidly and we st stitched together resources from the forum, from docs and Sondax docs and a bunch of other things. So we need to really uh, put a lot of work there. Uh, we also need a clearer value proposition uh, of why EVM, existing EVM developers should care about Febim. Uh, so there's a lot of more messaging clarity that we need to land there and also uh, to be able to scale to other blockchain communities and new new communities, we need a much better Filecoin primer for developers. Uh, so these are things that we're working on uh, in the FEM team. And, and yeah, you can see all the submissions in the first link at the bottom of this slide. And you can see a recap that ETH Global also posted in the second link. Super cool. If you are excited about building on FBM, check out the new uh, RFSs, Requests for Startup, that um, Raul and team actually just put together as well. It's awesome sauce. Quick note on Phil Angular. So um, we had a, uh, in a very fast pace, uh, Huddle uh, 01, which is a project that um, started on top of uh, Filecoin. They are a group that started with uh, with HackFS, which was one of the first hackathons that we did with Heath Global. Uh, maybe the first one, actually. Um, uh, right around Falcon Mania launch and has since become like a, a pretty strong startup in the Falcon ecosystem. Um, uh, organized Phil Bangalore uh, and it was a huge success. There were about you know over a thousand hundred attendees, uh, primarily developers. Uh, there were over thirty speakers and over twenty workshops or something like that. Um, there were several workshops for key Andros projects like FEM, Bacalao, Crypto Econ, um, and so on. Uh, a ton of demand and attention for FEM. Um, and, and computer over data and so on. Uh, you can see the workshops here, like they were super packed. Uh, so a ton of like learnings from, from all of that. Um, and I guess a, a great learning here is that the dev community in India, uh, India and Web3 has exploded over the last couple of years. Like it's just super massive. Um, and there's a lot of interest and demand in our tech. So for all of our projects, um, I heard about, um, you know, uh, I heard from developers on on all of the stuff that we're working on, from Liquid P to DRAN to to all kinds of things, so there's a, a huge, huge uh, developer community that's paying a lot of attention to um, what we're doing, and also super interested in contributing directly to a lot of the core protocols. So I, I got a ton of questions. I'm like, how how do I contribute to Liquid P, or how do I contribute to uh, to IPFS, uh, and so on. So um, I directed a lot of folks to uh, to repos. So should be hearing from 
uh, from folks there. Uh, and I think this should we should probably have a much stronger presence from from our teams uh, out there in uh, in 2023, and could be a great uh, place to um, both uh, you know recruit and to um, uh, yeah like help uh, form teams to to participate and work on a lot of these projects. And uh, from Phil Bangalore, uh, we're going to have ETH India uh, to, starting tomorrow, which is will be another hackathon, and um, and uh, also a strong presence in Polygon Connect. Awesome. We mentioned the FEM RFS, the request for startup. Um, pretty awesome. There's a ton of great examples there. If you are looking for something um, to build over your holidays or you know someone in your uh, connected set is looking to start something really cool in the Web3 space, um, send them this. There's some really, really great ideas that can be super high value um, and could lead into that. But cool. Um, that is it for our um, Andres All Hands. Um, thank you all so, so, so much. Um, really, really amazing to see this progress and have, uh, I don't believe we have another one of these before we hit our holiday break. Um, so have a wonderful holidays, everyone who celebrates, um, and come back well rested and pumped for the amazing set of things shipping out the door in 2023. It's going to be a legendary year. Um, and I'm super excited. So hope you all are too get a rest because it's going to be awesome. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much. <laughs>